Thanks for listening to The Leader, but please don't keep it to yourself. You can share the podcast through your provider and get in touch with us on social media with the hashtag The Leader Podcast. Now, from the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. It's Donald Trump v. Greta Thunberg at Davos. We must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. Without treating this as a real crisis, we cannot solve it and then we cannot see this from a holistic view. Who won? We speak to the Evening Standard's deputy political editor, Nicholas Cecil. Also, he calls it a hoax, repeatedly called it a hoax, and has demeaned it wherever he can. While the president's in Switzerland, his impeachment trial's underway in Washington. Our US correspondent David Gardner on what's happening on Capitol Hill and... He's already got a number of engagements in the diary, um, established with the American Friends of the Centre Bali. What Harry did next, royal editor Robert Jobson exclusively reveals what the prince is actually going to do now he's not a senior royal. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, Greta against the dawn at Davos. Every flight into the Davos summit this year is being carbon offset. Companies attending have been asked to commit to net zero emissions by 2050. How to save the planet is the key theme. They've invited Greta Thunberg to speak and Donald Trump. I'm proud to report the United States is among the cleanest air and drinking water on Earth. But of course, if you see it from another perspective or... Pretty much nothing has been done. Emissions of CO2 has not reduced. We must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. We start listening to the science and we actually start treating these crises as as the crises they are. These alarmists always demand the same thing, absolute power to dominate, transform and control every aspect of our lives. We will never let radical socialists destroy our economy, wreck our country. We are all fighting for for the environment and the climate, and it will require much more than this. This is just the very beginning. Our editorial column wants delegates to hear through the noise. The dangers of climate change are firmly at the top of the agenda at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Donald Trump, of course, remains sceptical, but would do well to heed the words of Greta Thunberg and listen more to the scientists, whose research points overwhelmingly to the prescience of her warning. Even if Mr Trump stays deaf to the evidence, there are encouraging signs from Davos that the need for change is being recognised in boardrooms and corridors of power elsewhere. The danger is that too much of this turns out to be corporate window dressing, rather than a sign of lasting determination. Environmental activists have a valuable role to play, but change can ultimately only come if business and governments invest in and adopt green technologies and more efficient processes. It's not too late, and the positive noises coming from Davos should be welcomed. Our Deputy Political Editor, Nicholas Cecil, is covering this for the Evening Standard and he's joining me from our Westminster office. Nicholas, Davos has saved the planet at the centre of its agenda, but in his speech to the forum, President Trump didn't seem entirely signed up to the green theme. No, he doesn't. Um, He arrived at Davos saying he is a big believer in the environment, but his speech was very quiet on actions on climate change. He boasted about the quality of air and water in America and committed his country to one to, to the one trillion tree project. But that was pretty much it. He did not name Greta Thunberg, who was speaking a few hours before him at the Alpine summit, but he did hit out at what he called the prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. 
They predicted an overpopulation crisis in the 1960s, mass starvation in the 70s, and an end of oil in the 1990s. In America, we understand what the pessimists refuse to see, that a growing and vibrant market economy focused on the future lifts the human spirit and excites creativity strong enough to overcome any challenge, any challenge by far. I'm sure she's heard similar from other places, but Nick, as you said, Greta had already spoken to the people in Davos. What's she been saying? Well, well, she delivered her message with striking clarity. And in essence, it is that while there's now a new focus on climate change, which she welcomed, she does not believe that this has fed through into anywhere near enough action to tackle it. She's basically saying that the science and voice of young people need to be at the heart of the debate, really, because they are the driving force for change. The climate and environment is, is a hot topic right now, and a lot thanks to young people pushing. Without treating this as a real crisis, we cannot solve it, and then we cannot see this from a holistic view. Nick, I think it's interesting that Greta was there at all. How influential has she become at this meeting? Well, I think her influence is growing, and this is partly due to the simplicity and clarity of her message, backed up by scientific details. And she's now also become an iconic figure, speaking for a generation, or at least large parts of a generation, which is determined to see tougher action against climate change. And I think there, there really is a step change happening on addressing global warming. More and more chief executives are also realising now that they have to do more on climate change, not just to protect the planet, but crucially also as it's in the, their own business interests. You have companies like Microsoft, which are now even talking about being carbon negative by 2030, which means that they'll be doing more to reduce harmful emissions than produce them. The, the fact that so much of the talk at Davos has been about climate change and Greta Thunberg being there, along with other young environmental campaigners, highlights her and their influence and how this issue is likely, likely to gain more momentum over the next few years, given the scale and growing immediacy of the threat. Next. Yes. He admits he did withhold $391 million worth of aid. And yes, he does not deny he discussed an investigation into Joe Biden. What he's saying is that the two things were not linked. US correspondent David Gardner talks to the leader about the first day of President Trump's impeachment trial. Being at Davos, the president's skipping the first day of his historic impeachment trial. It's getting underway on Capitol Hill in Washington, with Donald Trump charged with abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. In the States, our US correspondent David Gardner is keeping an eye on proceedings. David, he's out of the country. Is the president taking this seriously? Mr Trump would certainly want people to think that he cares not a jot about what's going on in Washington. He calls it a hoax, repeatedly called it a hoax, and has demeaned it wherever he can. The truth is quite the opposite. He knows the effect it will have on his legacy. In fact, the reason he's gone to Davos, a part of the reason, is that a big photo opportunity with world leaders will take attention away from the impeachment process. And that's his aim. So if he is secretly concerned about this, David, what's the president's defence? His defence to the claims of a, that he's abused his position and obstructed justice is there was no quid pro quo in his conversations with Ukraine. Yes, he admits he did withhold $391 million worth of aid from Ukraine. And yes, he he does not deny that uh, he discussed an investigation into Joe Biden when he talked with Ukraine's president back in July last year. What he's saying is that the two things were not linked. That's the key to this whole thing. His lawyers in a hefty file yesterday also claimed that the grounds for impeachment were just not strong enough. They say no crimes were committed um, and that simply the, 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 the whole process is being politically driven. Now, the Republicans are in control here and they made some moves to make the proceedings speed along. Mitch McConnell, who's the majority leader 
in the Senate is a Republican, and Republicans hold the majority. Their goal seems to be to, to make the whole thing go away as fast as possible. Uh, Mr McConnell is saying that each side should only have 24 hours to put their case. This is after uh, most commentators seem to suggest the Senate trial would take a couple of months. He doesn't want any evidence from the House to be given. Again, he's unlikely to get away with that, but he will give it a try. Uh, he doesn't want any new witnesses to be brought forward. They don't want any surprises. Uh, basically, the Republicans want the whole thing to go away as quickly as possible. As for Mr Trump, he too wants the whole thing to go away. But there is another side to it which is interesting in that some Republicans think the, the impeachment actually will have a positive effect on Mr Trump's re-election efforts. They feel that his kind of me-against-the-world attitude uh, appeals to his Republican base and may even help his election prospects. And we'll have impeachment trial updates on our morning news bulletins. Just ask your smart speaker for the news from the Evening Standard. Now. Ever since Prince Harry and Meghan announced they were quitting the royal family, everyone's been asking what they're going to do next. Well, the Evening Standard's royal editor, Robert Jobson's, found out and discovered Harry has some pretty ambitious plans. Robert, what have you learned? He really does want to expand his role as a charity entrepreneur right across America. You know, he sees himself as a global uh, figure and uh, he's more focused on charitable projects such as um, tackling the AIDS problem as a legacy to his late mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, through his charity, Centre Bali. And the point is, he's already got a number of engagements in the diary um, established with the American Friends of Centre Bali, and he'll be really focusing on those um, uh, in the next six months or, or so. Robert, it seems a lot of engagements have been lined up then. So has Harry moved fast, or has this been in the planning for quite a while? They've been making this, making plans to leave and to establish themselves in the way that they want to establish themselves for months. I think it's... It was a bit of a surprise to Harry that he couldn't quite get what he wanted. You know, he wanted to be part in, part out. And the Queen has made it quite clear that you can't do that. You know, you're either a member of the royal family, working um, for the royal family and supporting her, or you're not. And she she said, although, of course, that she loves Harry, Meghan and Archie and they're valued members of her family, that um, they're effectively out in terms of getting public money apart from the security costs, of course, that appear to be being picked up by both the Canadians and Scotland Yard at the moment. That's Harry. Do we know anything about Meghan's next move? We're told that she has, or they have, no commercial deals at the moment, but um, I would think that that's probably quite a long way advanced. I mean, they've registered their company, Sussex Royal, in Delaware, um, which is an advantage, apparently, taxation-wise, and that they can trade and look into the, all sorts of areas, everything from books to fashion lines, you know, they can deal with. So I do think that um, they've got a number of things already in the pipeline. Um, the Queen, of course, and the Prince of Wales and Prince William will review that um, in a year, they say. There is scope to do that. But personally, I think once you've let the cat out of the bag and they're out there doing their deals and their trading, it's going to be very difficult indeed to restrict what they actually do. You know, whilst they're establishing their independent lives on the other side of the of the world, you know, that's sort of America, the West Coast, it's pretty difficult to control what they're doing. And, um, you know, if they do do lucrative deals um, going forward, then the money that the Prince of Wales is going to be paying for his private income um, will become less and less important. So they, they'll have, or he will have, less of a control over the couple um, on their commercial activity. And that's The Leader. Thanks for listening, and please do share the show with your friends. You can also subscribe and rate us through your podcast provider. We're back at 4pm tomorrow. <laughs>